Welcome, fellow Stardust. Are you ready for a scare? I see you've come back for more. If you're new here, buckle up. And thank you all for joining me today. My name is DeRay, lover of all things dark, creepy, and weird. Today's film review will be on revenge thriller Mandy. around the serpent's eye. Strange and eternal. Today's review is actually a request from one of my subscribers and friends in absolute all, AKA Audrey. I thought I'd go ahead and do this once a month. One of my goals in doing these film reviews is to bring you films that maybe you weren't aware of or films that you overlooked because you didn't think it was for you. A lot of times films aren't marketed in the proper way and will get overlooked by its target audience. But I thought it'd be fun to go ahead and mix it up and add one review per month from a subscriber suggestion so if you have one please go ahead and comment it down below I will be giving out some spoilers but I won't give away too much detail even if I gave away every single detail though this film would still be worth the watch Mandy was shot in 29 days and they had a pretty rigorous schedule for 19 days straight they shot from 10 30 p.m. to 5 a.m. and it cost them just over six million dollars to make the film is set in the Pacific Northwest in either Oregon or Washington but it is shot in Belgium it was produced by a production company, SpectreVision, which was founded in 2010 and owned by Elijah Wood and two other filmmakers. They specialize in the horror genre and recently partnered with Ubisoft to make a virtual reality game called Transference. This cosmic revenge thriller is the story of a logger and his girlfriend who he's deeply in love with. They live a secluded life deep in the forest. One day, a sadistic hippie cult enters their lives, throwing Red, Cage's character, into a psychedelic revenge rampage. Directed by Panos Cosmatos, it stars Nicolas Cage as Red, Andrea Riseborough as Mandy, and Linus Roach as Jeremiah Sand. This is Panos's second feature. His first film is Beyond the Black Rainbow, which I haven't seen yet, but I am looking forward to it. I wish I had time to see it before doing this review. He says that his first film is sort of an inhalation and that Mandy is the exhalation. It's sort of the yin to the yang. He says that in Rainbow, he wants the audience to take what they want from it. He feels that each person's gonna come out of there with a different experience. Whatever interpretation you come up with is the right interpretation because it's yours. For Mandy, his goal was to completely immerse you in the film and you are completely immersed. I personally could not take my eyes off the screen the entire time. My expression while watching the film was and I was sober. Panos actually wanted Nick to be the cult leader, but when Nicholas read the script, he didn't connect with that character. He connected more with the character of Red. He had just experienced a traumatic loss and had a lot of emotion to draw from for that character. He really didn't connect with a character who needed a lot of attention and who was incredibly narcissistic. He didn't connect with that sort of evil. Panos had his heart set on Nick playing the cult leader, so he walked the other way. A few weeks went by and he molded over a bit and realized that he was being pretty stupid and called Nick back and got him as the lead role. And thank goodness because this is the perfect role for Nicolas Cage. Now I'm not a huge Nicolas Cage fan, but I do appreciate what he brings to the screen, especially in this film. He even says he feels like he was preparing his whole life for this role. So along with this psychedelic trippy theme, we also have religious cultism and the male ego mixed in with this cosmic fantasy. We're really exploring the mind of somebody who's experiencing traumatic loss, probably again. And then we're also exploring the mind of somebody who has extreme delusions of grandeur and superiority. Panos is incredibly successful in creating an entire world. 
not many directors attempt to create an entirely different world, and even fewer are successful at actually creating one. He achieves this through lighting, green effect, music, and other elements. He purposely chose to shoot most of this in the evening time to cover up any flaws that may have shown through because he was on such a tight budget, which was a benefit to him because the nighttime is so much more ominous and scary. We're immediately thrown into this world when Red leaves his job, turns the radio off in his truck, and heads home to his girlfriend in the middle of the forest. In the first half of the film, we're able to find out more about Red and Mandy and them as a couple. Mandy is a cashier at a convenience store. She loves nature. She has a passion for it. She's sensitive, but also has a quiet strength about her. Red is a bit more simple. He's rugged, uncomplex, and sort of defined by his relationship with Mandy. They don't really seem like a pair you would put together at first glance, but when you see them together, it makes sense. They both have troubled pasts, they both are a little bit self-destructive, but when they're together, they're better. Mandy is also an artist and her artwork is reminiscent of heavy metal music and graphic novels of the 80s. The title cards that are shown at the start of the three sections of the film are also reminiscent of artwork from that time. One of their first scenes together where we truly get to see their deep, passionate love for one another is when they're talking about Jupiter and Saturn. For me, this conversation foreshadows the rest of the film. She talks about how Jupiter is her favorite planet, and Red says that Saturn is his favorite planet. In Greek mythology, Saturn is told that one of his children will overthrow him, so he starts to swallow all of his children. When Jupiter is born, his mother saves him and raises him. Once he is grown, he orders Saturn to throw up his siblings, and then they all overthrow Saturn together. And to me, this is kind of what's about to happen. I see the cult leader as a Saturn, Red as a Jupiter, and Mandy as one of the siblings that was swallowed. Nick is avenging her death and thus setting her soul free as well as the soul of all the others that were falling at the hands of the cult leader. The second half of the film is when it really starts to get trippy. We really get to delve into the mind of Jeremiah Sand, the cult leader. He's your classic narcissist and will definitely remind you of Charles Manson. They don't have the same personality, but they have a lot of the same quirks. Jeremiah is a failed musician. If anybody reacted negatively to his music, he became very angry. He referred to all his victims as pigs and he would never do his own dirty work. He always had somebody else doing his dirty work for him. The male ego is severely poked at in this film. Panos laughs at the idea of someone even just feeling superior to anybody else. And we really see the horrors of the male ego when it is starved. Also in the second half, we really get to see Cage cage out. After Mandy's capture, Nick relapses and finds his hidden stash of vodka in the bathroom. There he begins to unravel. He just witnessed something traumatic and now is taking step backwards. And this scene in the bathroom is all one take and it's brilliant. Panos actually said they just did one rehearsal shot, they gave blocking notes to Nick and then they did one take and that was it, they had it. Nick does an amazing job showing the pain of losing someone. He had just gone through a divorce not that long ago, so for him it was easy to draw from this emotion. We really feel for Red in this moment and we miss Mandy with him. She was a strong presence and she brought light into Red and now we're slowly seeing his darkness close in on him. Panos's goal was for not only to have Red miss her, but for the audience to miss her as well for the rest of the film. Even the third and last segment is named after her, which she's not even in. The drug use in this film just amplifies and intensifies everything. And on that note, it does do a really good job of portraying what it does feel like to be on LSD. A lot of films and shows will attempt it, but it's nowhere close, but this is pretty darn close. This probably has something to do with his drug use back in the day, but once he lost a friend due to a heroin overdose, it kind of took a dark turn for him and he's kind of stayed away from everything, but it still influences his films. The psychedelic aspect just really allows for scenes to be slowed down 
and there's very little dialogue in each of the scenes. But while everything is slow and very few words are being said, so much is still happening. So much emotion is still bubbling inside of you all the while. We first get trippy when the women of the cult administer eye drops into Mandy's eyes. Then they get this huge wasp-like thing and stick her in the neck, which I guess enhances the effect of the LSD. Either way, it's beautifully disgusting. He stands there with his people trying to assimilate her into his cult. This is represented by his face changing into her face as he's talking to her. He then presents her with his music, but she ends up laughing in his face. The worst fear of any narcissist. This is to Mandy's demise, but we see Jeremiah's weakness. He speaks into the mirror asking for divine guidance, but it's clear it's just his innermost desires speaking. We see four henchmen that assist the cult and we're not too sure if these are demonic creatures or human creatures. You could go either way. It's said that this cult one day had a bad LSD batch and ever since then they have just been absolutely mad. And one of these henchmen is seen drinking an entire jar of the LSD as if it was a can of Sprite. Now does that mean that they built the tolerance or do they have supernatural abilities? His inspiration for the henchman comes from his obsession with apocalyptic worlds. One of his favorite films is Mad Max Road Warrior. We get to a scene where Red battles one of the henchmen and we're kind of further confused as to whether this thing is demonic, otherworldly being, or if it's human. And afterwards he finds one of their jars of this super concentrated LSD. And Nick simply takes a little taste of it which basically is his point of no return. It took just that much for him, a definite humanoid, to basically lose the last bit of humanity that he had left. Also in that scene, you have the commercial for the Cheddar Goblin, and that's directed by Casper Kelly, who also directed the episode of Too Many Cooks on Adult Swim. So if we wanna go into the realm of these henchmen being otherworldly or demonic, Nick has just taken this concentrated LSD and has become now a sort of demigod. He is now more powerful than ever and there's no going back. Inspirations for this film were from Panos' favorite film, Evil Dead 2 and After Hours by Scorsese. In After Hours, he realized just how much of a paintbrush the camera can be, and this inspired him to want to use the camera in the same way, to basically paint on a picture based on his own vision. And while this is set in 1983 and you do get those 1980s vibes, he said that this was more a fantasy of what he felt the 80s would look like and not what the actual 80s looked like. Panos had a lot of producers interested in helping him make this film, but he stuck with Spectre Vision because he knew that they would help him carry out his vision and his vision only. A lot of times on a director's first or second film and beyond, producers will put their hands in everything and kind of muddle up the vision of the director, and he didn't want that to happen to this film. And Elijah and his partners were really all about trusting Panos completely and letting him create the vision that he had. Panos knew what he wanted and how to bring that to light. Panos started off with the core idea and built off from there as he thought of more to add to the story. An example of this is when Panos collaborates a little bit with Nick on the chainsaw fight scene. Nick does an unhinging of his jaw, a call to Jason Voorhees. They're even next to a crystal lake and all the TVs are on channel 13. The chainsaw scene is a beautiful ode to Friday the 13th. Nick is such a dedicated actor that for this role, he tied himself up to a fence for two nights in just his underwear. He even didn't talk to Linus Roach for the entire shoot just to build that uneasiness and that tension between the two of them. Panos is asked about several things in this film to help people interpret what's going on, but he sort of shies away from them. And the ending is one of those questions. 
and it's a scene where he's just driving away and the earth doesn't look like earth anymore. To me, this represents him becoming a part of that demonic world of the henchmen. As I mentioned before, he took just a little bit of that concentrated LSD and lost every ounce of humanity that he had left. Just that little bit was enough to take him over to the other side and now this is his new world, the demonic world. This film is about love and loss and the fragility of the male ego. It's all wrapped up in an 80s neon tinted grainy package delivered to us with patience and thought and fully immersing us into an unknown world with no way out. Mandy definitely gets five rainbow skulls. Well, thank you again for joining me today. I hope I see you tomorrow when I upload a spooky story narration. Also, again, if you have any film review requests, go ahead and throw them in the comment section. And if you like this video, I hope you share it and hit the like button. And if you want to join the Rainbow Fright Freight Train, go ahead and hit that subscribe button along with the notification bell. That way you'll get notified every Thursday and Friday when I post more videos like this. All right, y'all. Peace.